Alright guys, so here's the aforementioned video that I promised you'd have by today. Sorry it's been late, but it's been a rough day. Didn't have a lot of time to get it done before now. Okay, so this is what plants are going to do when we can't do photosynthesis the normal way. Now note that normal photosynthesis, the way you've always been taught, the way that's not different, is actually called C3 photosynthesis. Because what we're going to make is a three carbon compound. But you're going to realize that in these two varying methods, we don't make that three carbon compound. We make something else. So hence the different names. So let's go ahead and step through this. Okay, so this is the stuff we talked about in class, but this is just going to give you an opportunity to write down the information that you need. But it's a review. So you know that photosynthesis is in two parts. The whole point is to be able to make glucose at the end of it. The first part are called the light-dependent reactions, and it utilizes sunlight and water, which you're going to get from the ground. And the second part is called the Calvin cycle, or the light-independent reactions, which is going to utilize carbon dioxide, which we're getting from the air. So plants have adapted a root system to collect water, and a shoot system, specifically leaves, to collect the air that they need to get carbon dioxide. So this is the structure of a normal leaf. We've reviewed this before, but I want you to pay particular attention to this region. So I told you that your palisade layer is where the majority of photosynthesis is going to take place. Those are the biggest of the cells within that middle region of your leaf. This bottom part, which is called the spongy layer, is so named because of all of these air pockets. Okay, So this is a normal leaf of a plant that does C3 photosynthesis or regular photosynthesis. The problem that we're going to run into is this is a really good way for your plant to lose water, like it's doing right here. It's not going to lose a ton of water because of the cuticle that sits on the surface of the leaf, the top surface, but on the bottom surface we have a direct opening in the form of the stomata that allow things to go in and out, including water. So that's, that could be a problem depending on the environment that your plant is found in. So on hot or really dry days, what the plant naturally does is it's going to close up those stomata, make those openings as small as possible so that it can conserve water. When the stomata are open, you can... Hold on, sorry. Like I was saying, when the stomata are open, it's a good way for water vapor, gaseous water, to transpire or to evaporate out of the leaf. So the guard cells that control the size of this opening, when they gain water, the stomata open. When they lose water, the stomata close. So it just depends on what's going on right here. Now, this is an adaptation to living on land. At one point, plants lived in water or really close to water. As they've moved on to land, this is an adaptation that they've had to make because all living things need water in their bodies. Well, plants can't always directly... Um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Plants can't always directly put the water back in their systems that they're constantly losing, so they have to, ha they have to come up with a way to keep what little water they have inside of them actually inside of them. Okay, so we know we close our stomata. That allows us to conserve the water that we have inside of our plant. But that creates problems because carbon dioxide is going to build up. We're making that when we split hydrogen away from oxygen in the light-dependent reactions. But the carbon dioxide that we need to start the Calvin cycle is also being used up and eventually will be depleted. So it's almost like we're shutting down our Calvin system. So we started off closing off these stomata so that we wouldn't have an issue, and we ended up creating an, a completely new issue that we're going to have to deal with. So what is, let's look at this issue in a little bit more depth. We know that we're increasing oxygen levels in the leaf. We know that we are decreasing carbon dioxide levels in the leaf. Remember that enzyme ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase, the one that's in charge of carbon fixation? It normally takes carbon off of carbon dioxide and bonds it to RUBP, or ribulose bisphosphate, our intermediate compound. This is going to cause... RUBP to be reduced because we're adding something to it and it's going to allow us to build a 
three carbon sugar for every turn of that cycle. Every time that cycle turns three times, we build a three carbon sugar, okay? That's normal photosynthesis. But when our levels are off, when oxygen concentration is high and carbon dioxide concentration is low, Rubisco bonds to oxygen instead of to the carbon. It tries to add the oxygen molecule to RUBP. So oxygen is a competitive substrate for carbon dioxide, at least when it comes to the enzyme Rubisco. This causes the opposite. It causes Rubisco to be oxidized, and it causes us to break down sugars instead of building sugars. This process is known as photorespiration. So when Rubisco bonds oxygen, causing an oxidation of RUBP and a breakdown of sugars, that is photorespiration. So this is what our Calvin cycle looks like normally. This is going to turn three times, one, two, and three, so that we can make one molecule of G3P, which is three carbons big. Those three carbons are coming straight from the carbons of carbon dioxide. The carbons are added to a five-carbon intermediate by the enzyme Rubisco. It goes through a series of changes where we utilize ATP, and then we reduce it and utilize NADPH, and then we build G3P. This is normal photosynthesis. But when oxygen is high, this is what happens. Rubisco really can't seem to tell the difference, so it goes ahead and it binds oxygen. When it binds oxygen and it adds it to that 5-carbon RUBP, we still have a 5-carbon RUBP. So when that molecule gets split, we end up with one 3-carbon compound and two, and one 2-carbon compound, sorry, and we've brought no carbon dioxide into the cycle. Remember, G3P is built on the carbon from CO2. So G 3P, sorry, using my old pencil, the handwriting might be terrible, needs, ooh, I don't know what this arrow is supposed to show, but anyway, G3P needs CO2. Without CO2, there's no G3P. So when we get to this step, the cycle's done. It's all over. You can't do any more because you have no carbon to use. So what happens to the, what we've made? Well, this three carbon compound stays, but these two carbons get added to some of the oxygen within that leaf, and now we have carbon dioxide. Not enough that Rubisco is going to bind it, but we've just made carbon dioxide, and we haven't made any ATP, so we've gained nothing, in other words. Okay. So the oxidation of RUBP ends up short-circuiting the Calvin cycle. We're going to lose our carbons to carbon dioxide, and we're not going to make any energy from it. There's not really going to be any photosynthesis because we're not making any glucose. If we could reduce on photorespiration, if we could cause oxygen not to even be involved in ribulose bisphosphate, then we could make that plant 50% more efficient. So what does this mean? Well, it means that plants that first started to do this, this photorespiration, they experienced, hold on guys. Okay, I don't remember exactly what I was saying, but um, it means that the first plants that underwent photorespiration would also have undergone strong selective pressure to do something different because photorespiration results in a plant that has no energy and no food, a, aka a dead plant. Okay, so through a process of evolution, alternative ways of getting carbon were evolved. So, how could we do this? How can we get carbon dioxide, or at least carbon, even though our stomata are closed and we're still producing oxygen? Well, there are two alternative ways. The first one is called C4 photosynthesis, and it's done by C4 plants. The second one is called CAM photosynthesis, and it's done by CAM plants. C4 plants figured out that it's all about location, location, location. If they could separate physically where carbon was fixed 
from where the Calvin cycle happened, they could still get the carbon they needed. It would involve using a different enzyme, an enzyme called PEP carboxylase, phosphoenol pyruvate carboxylase, but it would still work. Now this meant that they were going to have to change their leaf structure slightly, but at the end, you end up with a plant that can do Calvin cycle, even when their stomata are closed. Cam plants had something similar. Same problem that we need to fix, but the way they chose to fix it was what I like to call temporal isolation. So for them, it was all about time of day. If they could fix carbon during the night when the stomata were open, then you wouldn't have an issue and you wouldn't need a new enzyme. And if they could perform Calvin cycle in the day when the stomata were closed, you still wouldn't have an issue. Your plant would not be losing water. So we're going to step through and look at these two in a little bit more depth. Okay, so C4 plants figured out a better way to capture carbon dioxide. The first thing they realized, and I say they like the plants were alive, but you get the point, is that they added a step before the Calvin cycle, where they fixed carbon with a different enzyme, an enzyme called PEP carboxylase. The carbon that is fixed gets stored as a four carbon compound, hence the name C4 plants. It's directly related. Okay, now this is a direct adaptation to climates that are hot and dry. So a lot of our monocots tend to do this kind of respiration. Things like corn and sugar cane and rice and wheat and barley and oats and stuff like that. Now, they close their stomata a lot. They keep their stomata closed for a really long time. So that means that what they did was they built a separate section of their leaf, like another cell almost, where they could do different things. One part of the leaf would be used to do Calvin cycle, the other part would be used to do carbon fixation. So let's look at it. This is what we call C3 anatomy. C3 is just our normal photosynthesis. Remember, this is the same picture I showed you before. Whereas, this is what a C4 plant looks like. So if we zoomed in, this is what you would see. The C4 plants have added another section called a bundle sheath cell, just underneath their mesophyll cells. So this is your mesophyll cells. C3 has those as well. But this whole little section here, this big green blob almost, is what we call a bundle sheath cell. Notice there are no bundle sheath cells on C4 plants. Hold on a second, guys. So what ends up happening is carbon fixation happens in the mesophyll using the enzyme PEP carboxylase. And it is stored there until the Calvin cycle can run where the four carbon compound gets its carbon pulled off by Rubisco and then we run Calvin cycle in the bundle sheet cell. So two different places. We do carbon fixation in one kind of cell. We store the carbon, move it to the other cell, and that's where we do Calvin fixation. Calvin cycle, sorry. We never have to worry about extra oxygen or any of that because we're using a completely different enzyme. So why use PEP carboxylase? PEP carboxylase has a higher affinity or a higher attraction for carbon dioxide over oxygen. So the oxygen can still be present. It doesn't matter. The PEP carboxylase enzyme doesn't like oxygen at all. It's like saying, I prefer blondes over redheads. Well, it doesn't matter how cute the redheads are. I prefer blondes. So that's who I'm going to go for. That sounded really bad, but you get the point. Anyway, so hopefully this is clear. So let's look at the anatomy again. Again, it's all about location, location, location. Here is, here is our C3 anatomy. Lots of spongy layer, no bundle sheet cells. This is our C4 plant. Not as much spongy layer, big bundle sheet cells. Okay, so this whole thing here where my laser's running around, that is your bundle sheet cell, that entire thing. Okay, now. C3 plants, I think I said this wrong two slides ago, but C3 plants do have bundle sheaths. They're just not as large. Okay? 
So now let's talk about CAM. CAM stands for Crassulin Acid Metabolism. We never say that. We just call them CAM. Again, it's an adaptation to a hot and dry climate, but this one is a temporal separation. So C4 plants did a physical separation. CAM plants are going to separate temporally by time. If you think about it, the stomata are closed during the day, but they're open at night. So the perfect time to fix carbon would be at night when the stomata are open. The perfect time to run the Calvin cycle would be during the day when the stomata are closed. So you never have an issue. The reason this is called CAM, specifically this acid part, is because the carbon that is fixed is stored into four carbon acids. Okay? And then we bring them to the Calvin cycle, and then we do actual making of G3P. The types of plants that do CAM are our succulents, which means that they're like juicy on the inside, like cacti and pineapple and yucca and stuff like that. Maybe not yucca so much, they're kind of dry. All right, so here's some examples of CAM plants. So let's, let's summarize. We have C4 plants and we have CAM plants. They're both trying to solve the same problem. They have an issue with carbon dioxide and oxygen, and they need to reduce on how much water they're losing because of where they're found. So C4 plants choose to fix this problem by doing what we call temporal, sorry, by what we call physical separation. It's all about location, location, location for them. It's an anatomical feature. They take a cell that already exists and they make it bigger so that they can do more in that area. So they do carbon fixation in their mesophyll cells. They run Calvin cycle in their bundle sheet cells. They've changed the location that these different things operate in. Whereas CAM plants, they have all the same parts and pieces, but what they choose to do is a temporal separation. Their stomata are closed at night, so they, sorry, their stomata, clo ugh, let me start over. Their stomata are open in, at night, so they fix carbon dioxide at night where they don't have to worry about increased levels of oxygen. Their stomata are closed during the day, so that's where they run Calvin cycle, when again, they don't have to worry about trying to preserve water because their stomata are already closed. One of the main differences between these two is that your C4 plants are going to use a, use a different enzyme, the enzyme PEP carboxylase. All right, so why do we even have an issue with just regular photosynthesis? Why is this a problem? Well, it's all about evolutionary baggage. Remember, when plants evolved, there was no free oxygen in the atmosphere. It was a highly, it was a high level, sorry, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So Rubisco never had to deal with having to choose between carbon dioxide and oxygen. The only choice it had was oxygen. So in other words, it never developed an inaffinity to oxygen. It didn't know any better. Today, the levels are much different. We have, 20, we have an atmosphere that's made up of 21% oxygen and only 0.3% carbon dioxide. So there's definitely way more oxygen available now. Rubisco still has not gotten on the bandwagon and figured out that there's a difference between carbon dioxide and oxygen. All right, so that's pretty much it. Hope this was helpful. See you in class tomorrow.